The summer of 1933 is one of hot weather and high tensions. No place feels it more than Christie Pitts, a baseball diamond in midtown Toronto, next to Jewish and Italian immigrant neighborhoods. The surrounding neighbors make no secret of the fact that immigrants are not welcome. This isn't your country. Go home, Jew. Hey, what do you think he's trying to do? And the message is clear. We want to get the Jews out of the park. Those hate-filled voices against Jews were part of a deeply troubling movement unfolding in many parts of the world. In Germany, Adolf Hitler and his Nazi party rose to power in 1933. A vicious campaign against Jews and other minority groups soon followed. But the dangerous attraction of the swastika was growing on both sides of the Atlantic. During the Great Depression, some Canadians looked for scapegoats to blame for their hardships. In fact, anti-Semitism was nothing new in Canada. In the first half of the 20th century, Jews were relegated to second-class citizens. The few allowed into Canada as immigrants faced systemic discrimination. Businesses refused to hire them, universities restricted their enrollment, and entire neighborhoods prohibited the sale or rental of housing to Jews. Across Canada, local political leaders were vocal about their prejudice. They spread violent propaganda against Jewish people, turning decades of intolerance into hate. In Toronto, young Anglo-Canadians formed swastika clubs and embraced the Nazi symbol. One that was impossible to separate from the atrocities perpetrated against the Jews of Europe. In protest against Hitlerism, Jews took to the streets. They were joined by laborers, union representatives, and left-wing political groups. Motivated by different causes, they stood united against fascism. Thousands protested, but swastika clubs continued to incite hostility against Toronto's Jews. No laws prevented this, and so clashes regularly broke out between the two groups. That was the backdrop to August 16th, 1933, as Christy Pitt seemed ready to explode. At the Ball Diamond, fights erupt in the stands. Supporters of the predominantly Jewish Harvard Playground baseball team, members of the Swastika Club, and other Anglo-Canadians trade punches. Police have difficulty breaking up the fights. As the game ends, a homemade Swastika flag is unfurled on the slope next to the ball diamond. The swastika! The swastika! Hail Hitler! Hail Hitler! It's the spark that ignites all tensions. The swastika came at the end of the ball game. All hell broke loose. When this race riot broke out, it really broke out. All I saw was people getting hit. The bats all disappeared. We had 15 bats and they were all gone. The riot quickly spills out of the ballpark. Truckloads, truckloads from Spadina Avenue came up. Now there were some tough guys down there. Reinforcements arrived to support both sides. Italians and other immigrants persecuted by the Anglo majority fight alongside the Jews. Violence explodes across the night. For six long hours, thousands of people fill the streets of Toronto, with Jews, Italians, and others taking a stand against racist ideas of what it means to be Canadian. After the unprecedented violence, Mayor William James Stewart promises to prosecute future displays of the swastika. It's a small victory, paid for with black eyes and broken bones, but it's one of Canada's first anti-hate policies. Other lessons from the riot take longer to learn. Of the Western countries that took in refugees during the Second World War, Canada accepted the smallest number of Jews fleeing Nazism. The Christie Pitts riot remains one of the worst outbreaks of ethnic violence in Canadian history. The Jews and Italians who took to the streets that hot summer night in 1933 fought for the Canada we live in today. 
one that recognizes multiculturalism as a strength. That struggle continues to be our responsibility as hate crimes against Jews are still widespread across Canada.